What's going on, everybody? And welcome into the 75th episode of the Crazy One Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Stephen Gates, and this is a show where we talk about creativity, leadership, design, and everything else that helps to empower creative people. Now, be sure to subscribe to the show so you get the latest episodes whenever those come out, because I travel like an absolute idiot, so they don't always come out on the most regular basis. But here we are doing another show. And remember, look, you can listen to all the shows, get the show notes and more for this show and every other one. Just head over to thecrazyone.com. That's the crazy and the number one.com. So yeah, I've been, man, I have been spanning the globe since last we spoke to each other. I just got back from two weeks in Australia, a week in Phoenix. Tomorrow I'm headed to Santa Fe to do a design leadership camp before being home for all of 24 hours before headed to South by Southwest. But I wanted to make sure that we kept the cadence going, kept the conversation going, and did another show. Now, probably about a week or so ago, I went out on social media, which I do on a decently regular basis, and asked, based on a couple topics I was thinking about, which one did you want to hear about most? And this is the topic that won. So I think the thing here is that how you're able to accomplish what you want to do inside of your company can be so complicated because other people are involved. And, you know, I think one of the most common things that stands in the way of getting a lot of that work done is politics. And I think that dealing with politics often, in my experience, is a necessary evil. No matter what you think about them, no matter how much you maybe enjoy it, maybe you're like me and and absolutely hate it. Because I I think this is another one of these critical topics. And, And the reason why I think it's critical is because politics often will affect our budget our ability to grow our team, our ability to get work out the door, and a lot of other things because since creativity is subjective and involves other people, it tends to have a pretty big bearing on what it is we do. And I know, I mean, it is a it is a difficult subject. This is a subject that, it, you know, just to be totally honest, there are times whenever I want to take on subjects, and this is one of them, where I don't think that I'm an expert on this by any stretch of the imagination. I, I think in any, if anything, sometimes the politics and self-presentation and some of the things like that is something I, I still have quite a bit of work to be able to do. But, but I, I think, you know, for me, it is the opportunity to try to learn something to try to share what it is I learned, try and share some of my experiences and my struggles. And, you know, the, the challenge in doing a show like this is that politics are a dynamic problem and that they are unique to each company because, Politics are directly associated with personalities, and personalities are different. So with that in mind, in this episode, I want to take a look at, I think, some of the emotional issues behind office politics, and I think really talk about how to deal with them in terms of habits instead of things like actions or lists or something like that, because I've just, as I've started to think about this show and work through it, I just don't think that that's going to be any advice that's going to just sort of be broadly helpful. I think that it may be, you know, something that I learned or saw one particular company, one particular person. I'm not necessarily convinced that that's going to scale. But today we're going to take a look at Corporate Politics 101. The intros, the basics, and how to survive any of it with any amount of grace, dignity, and, and most importantly, I think, any effectiveness. But where do we start about this? Because I think that, you know, I've worked for a lot of companies left a company because, you know, what office politics really boiled down to was about one word for too many people. And that word was power. And in the face of that, the politics at some of these companies and some of these teams truly almost becomes, I mean, just honestly like a blood sport. It's like the Hunger Games where it's just, you know, whoever can pull off the biggest political victory, whoever can do these sort of things wins. And I think it's it's really becoming... A big issue. And I think in many cases, the reason why I say that, the reason why I think it's important to this discussion is because I see in so many cases where these internal politics and these wars and these power struggles, they almost become, not they almost, they, they really do become more important than the work that's being released. They become more important than what it is we're there to do. That somehow, you know, coming in at who's right or winning this particular victory or doing something like that. That, that seems to be more of the judge of success than actually shipping good product, than creating good experiences, than, than having good ideas. 
and I think especially for creatives, we're much more susceptible to this because I think, you know, obviously the work that we do is very personal. The things that we put out there, we love. And so whenever politics and some of this stuff comes into it, I, I think that, and this is why I sort of, I guess, wanted to start with the discussion around power, because I think power implies, and I think for many people that they, they think about politics and they think about what goes on inside of companies like it's a game. And I think if you think about it as in any game, that implies that there is a way to win. And, you know, for me, whenever I think about this stuff, I just think nothing could be further from the truth because it, a game has an end and, and someone wins. There is no way to win at business or win at office politics. So, you know, there's not a trophy if you get the biggest team. There's not a trophy if you have the most power. There's there's not an end to this game. It's not a finite system it's sort of an infinite thing that goes on and on and the company goes on and the industry goes on and, and there are these sort of things so it's not it's not a game where there's an end but i think this underlying thinking that we should be playing for power is just fundamentally flawed and i guess i, I don't really know that i have an answer for that but it's definitely an observation that i've seen in a lot of companies and a lot of my own work and a lot of my own career is that People treat politics like a game, and, and that's not the discussion I want to have today, right? Like, I know, as I did a lot of research, and, and the reason why I said I think there's a lot of information out there that's not helpful is I found tons, tons of articles about how to win at office politics. I just, I fundamentally, I guess, reject that. I, and I think that this is a point where I struggle in this in my own career, where I think I, sometimes I reject it to the point of almost not engaging in it whenever it happens to me, because I just fundamentally dislike it so much that it's just it's a difficult thing for me to deal with but but that's why i said is this I'm, i don't want to do this in terms of like right or winning or because i just i think for what it is we do that's not going to be a productive path and and to that end i think that since so many people do play it like a game that the consequences and i guess this is why i feel this way is that the consequences of those politics they can be damaging and they can be hurtful and I think in many cases, the reaction to this, the reason why I think so many people wanted to hear about this, is that the most common reaction here is that sort of fight or flight mentality. And those are both, I think, also problematic because I think fighting is only going to cause more resistance, more drama around whatever it is that's trying to get achieved, right? Because I think in many cases, you know, if you decide you're going to fight on something, there are sort of two outcomes. Either the person is going to just simply get run over by you, by whatever your opinion is, and accept it, which is not an outcome that you want, or they're going to sort of return fire. They're going to stand up and in an equal way say, look, I'm, I'm not okay with this. And I think flight can be just as bad, right? Because I think if you're going to run away with it, if you're never going to deal with it, then you sort of get labeled as a pushover and that people are going to take you for granted. And it's a hard balance. It's a hard line to walk to know, how do I get these two things right? And the thing for me is that the fight or flight is that neither one of these options are appealing. And you know what? Neither one are really good for your career. And so I think, you know, the, the first point I want to make whenever you're dealing with politics, no matter what it is, is that just remember, like, whenever you do this, you always have a choice. And that you've got to be conscious about how you choose your reactions in the situation because... Even if you have the right message or the right intent, but it's given the wrong delivery or it isn't given a voice or things like that, those are your sort of reactions. And I think, you know, having gone through this, the one thing that I realized is that the only thing that I can truly control is me. And me being the way that my mentality is, me being the way that I think about things, and me being the way that that isn't expressed in the way that it affects other people. If you play games, if you don't tell the truth, if, if you try to, again, do those sort of things to take advantage of you and who you are, then those have negative effects. And that's why I said, is I think this is something I'm not good at because, you know, there are times whenever I get hurt. I don't know what. I mean, offended seems like the wrong word. I, I don't know what. Disconnected something. I try to do my best with it, but I know, man, I can handle this so much better. I think this is one of the things that I'm, you know, just candidly sort of currently working on is trying to figure out how to be better with some of this stuff or how to see the glass half full whenever sometimes it it gets hard to want to keep pushing that rock up the hill. And And I think that, but this is the thing, right, is that just remember in all of this 
that that you've got a choice. Remember that no matter how bad the the circumstances are, no matter how bad the situation is, you have a choice in how you feel and you react. I think you know. Think about your emotions. Think about what prompts them and how you handle them. I I really talked in the past and repeatedly about why self awareness and sort of self regulation around emotional intelligence. Like we talked about this in episode seventy around emotional intelligence. Like why this is important, and I think. It kicks in here because I think, you know, this sort of emotional intelligence, it helps you pick up on what other people are doing, what their emotions are going on and understand, you know, what what's a sort of approach that they might like or dislike. It lets you get a little bit of insight into that. And so I think, you know, for me, that's that's sort of the foundation for this. But let's go in and actually start talking about how do you, like I said, not win at politics, but definitely at least understand it. And. You know, I think that the reason why eh, this is important, why it can be, I don't know what, in some cases can be useful, in other cases frustrating, is because politics often really short circuits your traditional like org structure, right? Like whatever you see on paper, whatever people put up and like, okay, here's the CEO and direct reports and all those sort of things. If that's your traditional org chart, one of the things that I've seen is that, you know, politics doesn't sort of rearranges those boxes, and you know that's why a lot of cases, whenever I come into a new company, come into a new team, you know one of the things that I like to do is honestly just sit back and watch people because I think you can tell a lot about what's really going on because you'll see that the power in a company rarely flows through the lines of an org chart, right? Like it rarely goes that sort of straight top down. In some companies, it does, but I think as you sort of get beyond the the C level of the CEO and their direct reports organizational power gets very interesting and very different. And like I said, I think it flows very differently. And as you start to study this, and this is something that I sort of became aware of, have tried to be more deliberate about, is that it it really will sort of come into two different forms. There is what can be described as sort of like hard power and soft power. And let me explain what each of those are, right? So I think, you know, hard power lines are the ones that, these are the ones that come from, an org chart, right? It's based on things like if you have a title based on your years of experience, in some cases, whether you have an office or a cube or or different things like that, right? But these hard power tends to be very visible and obvious to everyone. It is, you know, that my title is bigger. I am higher on an org chart. My office is bigger, right? Like there is some hard, tangible thing that shows a demonstration of power. Now, the ways you can usually spot this in an organization, there are a few sort of tricks that I'll look for. I think one is notice on your team, if people are referred to by title or again, if they have an office or like things like that, right? Like, and they're not referred to by their name. Those are hard power lines, right? Like those are things that are definitely signifiers that that is something that is important by a company. And, you know, I'll work with some teams and and you'll notice like they never refer to somebody as, you know, Kevin or Susan. It's like our SVP our because somehow with the title will then come that, well, since they have that title, they must somehow be more important. We know that that's not the case, but it's something to look for. Now, soft power lines, those are something a little bit different because these are the ones that don't follow the org chart. These are the ones that don't necessarily follow those sort of big visible things. These are ones that are, it's a little bit more based on things like relationships and trust hierarchies. It's based on what people can do, whose ear they have, you know, what can they influence? If you think about it, even on your team, there's probably somebody who isn't, you know, a really big title, but that's the one person that everybody goes to, or that's the person that, you know, can get things done. That's soft power. That's sort of more of the hidden network inside of teams. And and I think, you know, you can often see this because, you know, look for things like decisions that are made by just rarely a handful of people and that their power does not correlate to their title or their position in the company. Now, sometimes that can be because they're really caring. They really go out of their way. They're very giving, like, right? Like soft power comes out from a really good place. There's also times where soft power lines can be a bit like watching an episode of Game of Thrones, where it's just everyone's trying to manipulate each other and what can they do and who has what influence and trading on this sort of stuff. It's politics in the true negative sense of that word. But I think it's something that I do want you to be aware of and to pay attention to. And that even when you go back to your team and to your company, 
start to look for the difference between where the hard power lines sit and where do those matter and where are the soft power lines and where do those matter because you're going to find both and recognizing when and where they come into play is important because then you actually will understand and have a better sense of how do things really get done. Now, with that is again, sort of the foundation about remembering you've got a choice and remembering to be able to kind of look for these power lines. And I said, I, I don't want to talk about this in terms of winning. That, you know, for me, what I want to talk about this in terms of is habits that I think are going to serve you well. Because I think that, you know, it's like I said, politics are, since people are involved, they're very different. They're very different, different organizations. And I think, you know, as a creative, where we tend to need to move between a lot of different teams, there are just some habits that I think are probably going to be better for you to be able to develop. And so that's what I kind of want to walk through, is to be able to do these. And so really sort of put together what I think are the six biggest, the six best things that I think are going to help with this. Now, the first one is, you know, look, we're, we're in this age where we've sort of moved from visual design to product design, where in many cases, we're being asked to do more, we're being asked to include more people in our process, we're being asked to, to play a different role than just like the quote, unquote, make it pretty crowd, right? So as we're sort of in this space, I think one of the things that you'll see is that a lot of people have not caught on to the fact that this isn't just visual design anymore. And so we need to act differently. We need to do different things to be able to get our work approved. And I think you know, one of the first biggest ones is how do you actually build your connections, your network, your, you know, your sort of group, your circle of power, whatever that is inside of your company? Because, you know, I'll even see like the number one problem that I see in a lot of leadership, a lot of creatives, whenever they come out of something like an ad agency and they go to an in-house team they don't really understand the importance of building connections. And you see them struggle because, you know, they think that they can either do whatever they want or that they can just simply, I don't know what, almost like dictate that sort of thing, like just tell everybody else how it's going to be. And that's not how you get things done. I would argue even at agencies, that's really not how you get things done. But I think, you know, look, you come from a very design-centric culture, design-led, maybe you can get away with it. But you need to include other people. You need to include other teams. You need to build consensus to be able to do this. Because, again, remember, creativity, ideas, you know, a lot of these things are highly debatable. And so our ability to bring other people in this, to build consensus, to build a cohort around us that agrees with us, I think, one, allows the work to move forward. But then I think in many cases, and the reason why I want to start with this, is because it can protect really good ideas. Because if you have an adversarial relationship, those people are then going to come in and try to rip down the idea, to find faults in it, to immediately go to, here's what's wrong. It's that snap judgment, just react without all the facts thing that drives creative sideways up the wall, right? Like it doesn't, it's not the way that we work. And, you know, because what we're dealing with is something new, it's a little bit more fragile. So what you need to do is you need to look beyond your immediate team. You need to look at, you know, again, what... What are the, what is that hierarchy? What are those power lines? What are the people that you have very you know and start with very natural places that maybe you've got connections, maybe it's coworkers, managers, executives, things like that, because you know that's that's where you want to start is start with the people where again where they quote unquote get it, because those are going to be easy conversations for you to start with, and then once you do that, start to work out to the people that are a little bit more challenging, but just sort of build your base. And the other thing I'm going to tell you to do is to not be afraid of people that are politically powerful. Like I said, maybe that's a hard line. Maybe it's a CEO. Maybe it's a CEO executive, an SVP, a big title, right? Don't be afraid of them. Or don't be afraid of people that, again, have a lot of sort of soft power and are able to get things done. Get to know them. But I want you to do that because the reason why I see this go wrong so many times is that people want to get to people who are politically powerful to suck up to score brownie points, to to just be like, oh, you know, I, I can talk to the CEO or whoever that is, right? You need to build higher quality connections in that, right? Like that sort of empty flattery, that BS, that suck up brown nosing thing with an executive of any quality, with a person of any power is going to fall flat. And if anything, it's probably actually going to play against you. Because I think in many cases, just sort of finding that hollow reason to be able to do that, just so that you can get that little... I don't know what, self-validation, I guess, is not going to serve you well. But I think in many cases, I also see too many great people, too many great ideas, too many great things like that who stop themselves because they're like, oh, 
that person is too busy. Oh, that person doesn't have time. Oh, I don't, you know, they're too important. They're whatever that is. That's you stopping yourself. Let's be clear. That is not them saying no. Like, look, you go to them. They don't have time. They don't do whatever it is. They're not interested. Fine. Then you know, but take the shot. Try to build that connection. Try to get that voice. Because again, I think especially right now, as we're looking at this, as creatives are trying to get more of a seat at the table, as we're trying to say, what is the impact of design? How do we measure what we do? We have to find more ways to break through. We've seen this in the numbers. We've seen it in the studies that most designers and most design teams struggle whenever it times to move past just them. As it comes time to be able to start to work with other teams, as it comes time to be able to start to interface with these other people, this is where we struggle and we aren't sure what to do because these are arenas that we're not comfortable in. But look, that's the thing, right? Like be friendly to everybody, but also to reach out and to make progress, invest in this. And look, don't like, I would say don't, and whenever you do start this, don't align yourself too closely with any one group or another, especially if it is a highly politicized environment where it's sort of like West Side Story, where it's one side against the other. Don't get caught up in that because at some point that you usually blow up, burn out, do something. But to think about how are you building your connections, not only for you personally, but for your team, especially if you're in a leadership position. You need to be able to think about these things to be able to figure out how do you position your team to be successful, not only today, but in the future. Because in many cases, you might want to move them to a different part of the organization. You might, get, might want to get them funded differently. You might want to get them seen differently. And this is the way you're going to start to be able to do that. Now, from there, I think that politics is about people. So this is one of those cases where I will make an argument where I think that strong interpersonal skills will help you build and maintain a really good network. And this is going to come out of a few, a few different things, right? I think there are the obvious ones around communication skills, about being friendly, about going up, talking to people, being open. You, you know, are you setting up office hours or AMAs or like whatever that is, right? Like those are just sort of the basic communication skills. There's a hundred places you can go to find out about that with a lot of people who are smarter than me. I, I do think that when it comes to people skills, though, there are a few wrinkles in here that are important. I think one is, most importantly, how do you manage differences? Meaning, look, you're going to encounter conflict. You're going to encounter differences that might seem hard to sort of make sense of. This is going to happen at some point in your work. And I think that the ability to work through this and to not – because, look, this unresolved conflict, I think it's it's damaging. It's disruptive. It affects morale and productivity. It can result in a lot of personal animosity, of people feeling like, you know, they've got to take sides. It can, you know, people can get very hurt. And most of the time, whenever you track it back, it's usually over some really dumb shit. Or it's like over something that if handled the right way, really could have just been handled in a five-minute conversation and not blown up into this Machiavellian, you know, soap opera telenovela thing that it seems to have turned into. But, but understand how do you manage the differences. And I think in many cases, managing differences usually, for me, comes down to two things. One is getting to make sure that both sides understand the communication style in how do you actually communicate? Are you emotional? Are you rational? Are you a driver? Are you a facilitator? Are you, like, there's a lot of different studies online. I'll put links to a few of them in the show notes. But, but to understand that, again, people will communicate and want different things. That does not make you right or them right or you wrong or them wrong. It just means that they're different. And as I've talked before and you've heard me say, I feel like these differences, when managed correctly, can really go a long way. But I think whenever there are these sort of things, when you don't know how to manage your differences, it becomes suffocatingly toxic. And it's one of these things where, like I said, you need to be able to figure out how do you do that? And again, for your company and for you, but it's something you're going to need to do. And, and then there's the inverse of also how do you manage agreement? Because the first step in, in, in that sort of thing, in, in interpersonal skills, in developing relationships with other people is trust. Because, I, look, trust is going to let you be more effective. It's going to make you take more risks. It's going to make you feel more secure. And, and I think, look, there are a lot of different things that you can, you can do about this, but I think You know, you also need to look at how do you manage when things are going well and how do you manage trust? Because, you know, both of these sides of the coin, you know, the conflict, the conflict side is easier because it's just so much more apparent. But I think, you know, whenever things are going well, trust can become a really important thing because I think also the fall from a position of trust is so much bigger. It's so much higher. You feel even more emotional whenever something, you know, comes out of that. 
But I think the other part of this is, and, and I see, look, I, I've seen a lot of people sort of lose their way as they try to develop this, is that whenever you're developing these skills, whenever you're thinking about you, I, I want to make sure that you think about how do you maintain your integrity, right? Like your ability to stand up for what you believe in, because I really think that that's sort of central to any interpersonal skills, right? And integrity enables you to measure your choices and your decisions when you deal with other people, right? And to somehow benchmark it against your values. And I, I think that I've seen so many people who lose themselves. They lose themselves trying to be what they think executives or the company wants them to be. They lose themselves trying to pretend to be somebody you know that they think is the way important people act. They lose themselves by you know sort of not walking their talk. They they lose themselves for a lot of different reasons, and you know the ability to do that with integrity is important. But I think there, this this is a tricky one because I think in in some cases there's also a difference between integrity and ego. Integrity is that you do what you believe in. That it is your, like some people will talk about, about living your truth, speaking your truth, doing things like that, right? Like that, integrity is, is you doing that. But I think your integrity and your opinion cannot blind you. It cannot, it is not a right, it is not a pass for you to run other, over people. It is not your ability to just do whatever the hell it is you want. Yes, believe in what you believe. But do not discount in the face of that what other people believe. Because I think, you know, integrity does have sort of a moral aspect to it. And in this case, where I know in the past, I've sort of split the words between like honesty and candor and different things like that, because I felt like honesty was a moral judgment. You know, integrity, I do think, does need to have a little bit of morality to it. Because in a lot of cases, you know, especially in this case, when we're talking about politics, it doesn't give you the right to run over other people, to crush them, to just do whatever the hell it is you want in service of your goals. Those sort of leaders will stumble at some point. Those sort of people will have to reap the whirlwind at some point. And to the point whenever that happens, the thing that they're going to find is that the people who thought about other people, the people that even if we disagreed, we were able to have a discussion, the people that even if we disagreed, we were still able to respect each other. The, the ones who instead will just do whatever it is they want, they're going to start to play games, they're going to play politics, they're going to do all this stuff where, you know, I, I think that a lot of people are going to come out the other side of that sort of feeling played. They're going to feel... They're not going to have a good feeling about that. And whenever that happens, whenever that person stumbles, nobody's going to be there to catch them. And it's hard and it's lonely. And like I said, as I think, you know, look, I'm, I'm well aware that in many cases I'll ask time, people to be to be crazy. But I'm also very clear about not being stupid. There, there's a difference. Because I think crazy is the one that will stand up for what you believe. But, but it's not doing it in the face or the blindness to the organization or what's going on around you. So I think that, you know, that sort of leads to the last part about in, about kind of developing your skills. You, you need to invest time in listening. You, you need to slow down. You need to focus. You need to learn. And, and, you know, because if this is about people, you need to listen to them. But then I think it's also, you know, your responsibility. And again, I think this is where one of the things I'm working on is I think you also need to create situations that allow for that listening to happen, where you need to ask questions, where you need to solicit feedback, where you, you need to be able to, to do that. And I think in that moment, you also need to understand that if you're the one that's being asked for feedback, you carry the burden of telling the truth, to, of honestly telling the truth, not like harboring a grudge, telling everybody else, trying to like, because again, that, that's, the, that's the, the side of politics that is destructive, is the point where it becomes, again, that sort of emotional mess. But I think that, you know, that there is in that moment to, to listen and to be on the other side to be able to speak. I, I think this is why a lot of things like you know, engaging in improv class or things like that for a lot of creatives can be really valuable. And the reason why I will you know, ultimately even recommend doing things like improv is because improv is about active listening and then active reaction. And I think when we talk about leadership, when we talk about a lot of these sort of things, these are the skills that become really important. But there are often things that you're not going to have much control over too. It, because if we're going to have an honest conversation about politics, I'm not going to, you know, spin some sort of Pollyanna tale about, you know, you're going to be able to go out and control everything and be able to great and run the world, right? Because one, that's a winning construct. But look, there are times where there's corporate politics, client demands, you know, mandates from your boss that influence you and your work. And, and that not everything is something you're going to have, you're going to have the ability to really influence. But I think at the same point, you know, on the one hand, look, I don't, I don't advocate going to war over it. But on the other hand, I don't advocate just simply sitting there and sort of taking, you know, quietly just accepting it. Because for a lot of people, and look, I would put myself in this, as I look back over my career, like, you know, too many p 
people too many times, too many times I've just sort of bitched and complained about these events that I can't control. And when you step back and you think about it, it is a short-term emotional outlet. And I think this is one of the places where, again, I will be very open that I try to work on about how not to give in to that, you know, I don't know what, slightly darker, slightly more emo side of myself that just that just wants to be angry and sort of not, and, and just, I don't know what. And I guess the response tends to be proportionate to the, to the size of the change. If it's a small thing, I just sort of like grumble around, you know, go pet the dog, feel better, move on. Bigger things like that are a little harder for me to move past. But I think, you know, the thing is that the ability to do that, it is a short-term emotional, emotional outlet, but what, what results did it really accomplish? What, what did it make better? And you know what? Pretty much most every instance, it probably didn't really accomplish much of anything. So here's the thing. is Instead of feeling victimized or angry about the situation, focus on the things that you can do to influence that, that, that situation. Focus on the ways that, again, even if you don't agree with it, how can you make it better? How can you change it, influence it? Maybe that's one conversation. Maybe it's a series. Maybe it's a, something that can be done quickly. Maybe it's something that's going to take a whole lot of time. But the way you want to do that here again is that your circle of influence, those sort of people, those relationships you built can be your power. Because if it's something you believe in, go fight for it. Go you know, express your opinion. Go do something about it. Make changes. Do something different. Don't Because again, don't just blindly accept it because that's going to sit and fester. But I think the ability to have this network, to be able to have that sort of support system, it helps you overcome because ultimately what it is is a feeling of helplessness. Again, if we're really going to be honest... That's where politics for most of us sucks the worst. It, and it takes that victimized feeling away. And it lets you see that someone, you know what, cares. It lets you see that you have support. It lets you have conversations. It lets you release the frustration in a more productive way and to be able to have a conversation around it. But here again, they need to be honest conversations. Because again, if you start playing games and playing politics and doing that here again, now we're back to having a problem. And look, you, know, you may not be able to change the eventual outcome. You may still have to accept whatever the decision was. But you can walk away knowing that you've done your best. And you didn't let this bad decision, you know, on the, uh, on the behalf of other people, you didn't let the politics, you didn't let somebody else doing something make you bad too. And in many cases, because I think at the end of the day, you know, at some point the team fades away, the company fades away, and you're left with you. As you move from company to company, as you move through your career, you're left with you. And, you know, the thing is, in all this, none of us are perfect. We're all broken. We're all broken somehow. Some, some ways may be very small. Some ways it may be very big. But your ability to live with you, to live with the decisions that you made, to live with the truth that you know. Like I said, don't, don't be blinded by it. Don't, don't just say that I'm always right and don't do that. But your ability to know that you fought, that you tried, and you did it better. That, that is what can become incredibly important. But I think that the other part of this, and, and one of the things that I do think is important in this, that, that I do want to bring up, is that, because look, whenever they're office politics, you're going to get angry with people. It happens, right? No, no team is perfect, especially whenever you do creativity, whenever you do things like that, ideas are shared, taken, you know, worked on, teams are built, people come and go, not everything, you know, is, is, is sunshine and rainbows. There are going to be times when you want to sort of give in to that urge, give somebody the, pe the piece of your mind and teach them a lesson. Yeah, don't. I think that in many cases with politics, like I said, that, that's the ugly side of it. That's the manipulative side of it. That, that's the side that is not going to serve you or your career any good. Because, you know what, people... People remember the moments when they were humiliated or when they were insulted. They remember the moments they were lied to. They remember the moments, they remember the arguments, they remember the times whenever they thought somebody was one person, they turned out to be something else. Even if you win the argument or, or you know, even if you make some sort of short-term decision that gets you the business result that you feel good about, and you may feel good about it now, you're going to pay the price later. Because I, I, I think, you know, my only thing is just this industry is too small. Too many people know each other. Too many, like it's just, you know. And and the one, the one of the only real things that you'll carry as you go forward is your reputation. And this sort of win at any cost mentality. You know, yeah. There are some companies that want it. You, I'm sure you can find a career and make a very good track out of doing that. For me, for for the way that I've done things, 
you're going to pay the price. And, and you're because you're going to need help from somebody down the road. You're going to need help from some sort of thing, a recommendation. You're going to apply for a job and, and without, you know, even being on the reference list, somebody's going to call somebody, right? Like, and it's like I said before, you need to build a network. And the last thing you want is to screw it up because you got anger towards somebody, you know, all because you enjoyed this sort of brief moment, this emotional outburst at somebody else's expense. And, and I think that's the part of all of this, right? Is that it, it can't, it can't become personal. We need to be able to disagree. We need even at times to be able to be angry, but we need to be able to sort of put it in the middle of the table to be able to discuss it honestly, openly, fully, and to be able to move on from it because of the moment that it gets personal, the moment that there feels like there is an agenda, that is where politics that is destructive. That's where politics ruins relationships. It ruins people. I, I've seen it with too many people. I've seen it with people who don't even understand that it's happening to them and they don't understand why because they've given into these, these sort of things. And so if it's not going to be personal, what should it be, right? Because whenever conflicts happens, whenever politics happens, it's easy to be sucked into that like tunnel vision focus on, okay, great. Well, like, what's the immediate difference? What's the immediate reaction? I will, I'll tend to say that whenever you sort of turn it just, you know, what, what can I get out of it? What can I do? Like whenever, whenever it starts with, you know, I too many times and too many sentences in a row, it becomes self-defeating. And the thing is that, you know, in many cases, whenever it is that sort of personally driven agenda, the chances are you're going to, you're going to invite more resistance by focusing on the differences in people's positions and opinions than, than if you try to focus on something else. And, and the thing for me is that with all of this is to take it out of being personal, the way to sort of mitigate that without looking like, you know, you're trying to, because again, like I, I don't want to look like I'm fighting to emerge the winner in a conflict is I want to focus on, again, to realign the source of truth. We talk about it in the work about how do you realign the source of truth? Politics really is pretty much the same. Focus on a business objective because look in the, in, in the light of what's best for the business, you can discuss the pro, the pros and cons of that. It becomes a neutral ground to be able to talk about this. Because, you know, look, at the end of the day, hopefully everybody wants the business to be successful. And if the business doesn't win, then nobody in the organization is going to win. So it gives you a, a sort of this third party. It gives you a place that by steering the discussion in that direction, you're going to, you know, you look, you're going to disengage from those petty differences, from the personal stuff. And, and you're going to make it about how do you get things done, right? Because politics at its best is about how do people come together? How do they work together? How do they get stuff done? It's the structure that gives that frame. It's the power that, that drives it forward. At its worst is whenever it becomes personal, becomes about power, becomes about something else, right? So focus on the business. But like I said before, and I think this is the last point that we've sort of talked around a little bit, is that, you know, in many cases, politics comes down to power. Who has it? Do I have it? You have it. Who has it? Who's right? Stuff like that, right? And, and look, I think maybe it happens because we're taught to win, right? Maybe that's just because in, in so many things, there needs to be a winner. But the problem is the result of that, somebody else has to lose. And at, and at the same time, we're afraid to let other people win because it implies that somehow we're weak. We're not a leader. We're not in control. Because if there's a winner, then there has to be a loser. If there's right, there's somebody is wrong. This is what I'll continue to come back to when we talk about creativity, interpersonal relationships, stuff like this. Right is not the goal. Winning is not the goal. And for me, it really is about, you know, I'm a big believer in you put the shoe on the other foot. Learn to think in terms of how can we both win in this situation. And, and I think in a lot of cases, this requires you to understand the other person's perspective and what's in it for them. This is why I'm a big fan of put the shoe on the other foot. Because if I'm about to do something, if I'm about to say something, if I'm about to act in a particular way, if the roles were reversed, how would I feel? Would I be okay with that in, that decision being inflicted upon me? Would I be okay with, with me acting that way, with someone else acting that way towards me? Would I think about it? It's a simple thing, but it can be powerfully enlightening to be able to go back and say, okay, look, I did this. I made this decision. I you know did whatever it is, and, and I believe in that. It, there can be a real arrogant blind spot in that. And like I said, the ability to, to flip the roles around and be able to say, look, if this hard decision, if this whatever it is, if this way of acting, whatever that is, was about to be done to me, how would I feel? And look, you know, there's some part of Brahmer. Maybe you don't care. You should. Because I think you need to find a solution that's going to work for both sides. And I think the, this ability to approach things as win-win, it's an enduring strategy, I believe. I think that it, it's how you build allies and it helps you win in the long term. 
And that's that's really what this is about, right? Is that it is about how do you build these relationships? How do you get stuff done? How do you look back? Because whenever you look back at things, it it really is about it's about how do you look back at what did you accomplish together, right? You remember the good stuff. You you remember those sort of really high moments, and you remember the low moments. Everything else in between seems to fade away, right? Like all the conference calls, all the discussions, all that stuff fades away. But how how does everybody win? How does everybody get better? Because that's why I said is I see too many teams too many organizations that that's what they value is winning. They value winning an internal battle. That's why all of their experiences, you know, the organization of their experiences match their org chart. That's why, you know, they're a superpower. And the best thing they're best at is rationalizing mediocrity because the work is the truth. Keep saying it for a reason, right? If internal battles and politics are what it is you really want to win, it's going to show up in the work because all of those battles and all that stuff, great internal victories, does not do a damn bit of good for the work. And that ultimately is what's going to matter. That's your source of truth. But that's the thing here, right? Be open. Be honest. Don't play games. But at the same point, right? Like, don't be naive. Know your value. Know what you bring to the team. Know what you can do. But know that your responsibility and obligation to the team is bigger than just you. No one politics has gone too far. Look, Nobody's perfect. I'm not saying that. I'm not asking you to go out and make their best decision every time. I'm asking you to think about other people. I'm asking you to try to take the better road. And when you don't, go back and have a conversation about it, an honest conversation about it. Say, I'm sorry. Talk about whatever that is. Find a way to get past it. Don't let it sit. Because that's when politics is at its worst and the most destructive, is whenever we make it about all this other stuff, right? We make it about winning. And that's... That's not what this should be about. That's like I said, you know, in some ways, I, I, I wish I could probably help give more tangible, specific, you know, go talk to this person and do this and one, two, three, you know, equals five. But that's just not the way people work. And so, like I said, focus on these couple things, right? Like go out and build connections and, and to, to do it genuinely and honestly, you know, develop your people skills, really look at how do you manage the differences? How do you manage agreement? How do you do it with integrity and, and to listen to people while you do it to understand that, you know, again, that that network can be a source of power and it, it can really be a place to be able to help you do that. Whenever you have these disagreements, when you do this sort of politics, don't ever make it personal because that just takes it to a very different place. Instead, focus on the business and focus on other people. Think about how do both sides win, not just how do I get my way? Because that's sort of black and white thinking. Again, somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Why can't we just find a better way forward, right? Because I think like any creativity, any, any of the work we do, the best work is going to figure out how do I take this challenge and overcome it? How do I incorporate that client feedback but still make it something that I'm proud of? This is a struggle that permeates through everything that we do. The thing is that whenever it goes into this space and into politics, it somehow becomes ever so more personal and as a result, ever so more difficult to, to be able to make it work. So look... If this is helpful, if any of these shows are helpful, do me a favor. Head over to your favorite podcast platform. Take just a couple seconds. Click on the stars, leave a review. Let people know what you think about the show. Make sure you subscribe to the, this podcast on that same platform so you don't miss any episodes. As always, you can find out more about the podcast, related articles, learn about different things, stuff like that. Head over to thecrazyone.com. The words, the crazy and the number one.com. You have any questions? You want to follow up on this? Look, follow me on social media. Like the show on Facebook. Um, I'm always posting updates, articles. Ask me any questions. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. There are times like now, whenever I'm traveling like an idiot, I try to do it as quick as I can, but I'm just going to be honest. Like Sometimes I, I get overwhelmed, so if you write me and I don't get back to you within, I don't know what, we'll say a week? How about a week? Does a week sound good? That if it's inside that time frame, ping me again and say, hey, you know, I still really would love that answer. As always, everybody down in legal wants me to remind you that the views here are just my own. They don't represent any of my current or former employers. This is just me talking. And finally, I say it every time because I mean it every time, but thank you for your time. I know that time is truly the only real luxury that any of us have. I'm always incredibly humble that you want to spend any of it with me. So go out there. Fight the good political battle. Go out and make a good difference. And whenever you do it, don't be stupid. And instead, stay crazy. <laughs>